Kalev ben Yofuna has one of the most interesting lives out of all the characters in the Torah and the later parts of the Nevi'im. And his story starts in Mitzrayim itself. It could be, it's possible that Kalev and his son Chor were among the taskmasters who were savagely beaten by the Egyptians. And he then, his, then, his story then continues and only gets greater when we're discussing the whole story of the spies. But his actual start of his story started 40 years before the redemption from Egypt. He was born to a man by the name of Chetzrin. Chetzrin was a grandson of Yehuda. He was very, very old at that time, possibly 170 years old when he gave birth to his son, Kalev. And he married someone who, according to one opinion, her, her name was Yefune. And after giving birth to his son, he, she remarried to another man by the name of Kenaz. And Kenaz is the one that raised young Kalev. Kenaz is actually the title, the Kenizi, or the son of Kenaz. Kalev is later given the name of his stepfather, because his stepfather was took him into his own house and raised him. And so Kalev, you know, gave a lot of the credit of his of his raising and who he became to his stepfather who helped raise him. He was a great grandson of Yehuda, and therefore obviously father after son, so he was from the tribe of Yehuda, and he grew up in the in the thickest of the of the of the horrible oppression of the Egyptians to the Jewish people. And for the next forty years, he was going to suffer together with all the Jewish people. He wasn't from the tribe of Levi, which meant he worked extremely hard and was oppressed. And he lived through throughout all the worst of the sufferings, and then was part of the redemption. But forty years before he was born, there's a very interesting story. He had, he wasn't yet born, and Moshe was born forty years earlier. And when Moshe was born, three months later, Moshe was placed into the basket, famously. And his sister, his um, big sister Miriam, and his older brother Aaron both stood by the side. And Aaron was shedding tears as Moshe's basket was lowered into the Nile. And then they waited and watched for four hours. They waited with Moshe's um, little baskets. And then they saw people approaching. And to their horror, they discovered the people approaching was an entourage together with the princess of Egypt. Pharaoh did not have a son at the time, which meant that this girl was possibly the next heir in line, and they they knew what Pharaoh was like. Pharaoh was was a dreadful human being who was literally killing killing the nation. But at that point, the accus- the the worst part of the decree was every single male child born to the Jewish people was being thrown into the Nile, and they saw the daughter heir to the throne walking literally towards the Nile with a whole entourage. Now, they didn't know, or maybe they did, but Miri um, and Batya, Basya, the daughter of Pyro, was actually going to the Nile to cleanse herself. She decided that she'd had enough of her father's idol- idolatrous ways and her father's terrible behavior and his whole lifestyle, and she decided to go exploring on her own to lead her own life and change around the lifestyle that she'd been raised with. And she finally came to the conclusion that God of the Jewish people was the real God. And she decided that she wants to remove herself from it all. And she went to the Nile together with her entourage, with the girls that went with her, with the intention to convert. She was going to go into the Nile, she remove all the impurity from herself and declare herself a Jew from then on onwards. And additionally, she had leprosy. Her father was afflicted with leprosy. She was too. And she went to the Nile with, with her entourage, and she went to bathe in the water. And as she's going to the, into, towards the water, she sees a basket. And the basket has a child. And it says, it says that she hears a child weeping, a young boy we, weeping. According to some opinions, it actually wasn't Moses. It wasn't young Moses in the, the basket that was weeping. It was actually the older brother on the side watching what was unfolding. And she stretched her arm. Some people say literally her arm stretched. And she was the one to grab the basket instead of sending one of her attendants who would have definitely killed the baby the second that they got that their hands on it. But she herself got the baby. She looked at the baby and the baby's face was shining. And according to the Medrash, the second she touched the baby, her leprosy left. And she knew straight away from looking at the baby and the incredible miracle that just incur- unfolded in front of her eyes that this baby was someone extremely special, extremely precious. And she committed to take care of this baby. She declared the baby her own, her own at, um, attendant said, your father has a decree every child needs to be killed. You're taking one of the babies from the water and instead of killing, you're saving. What are you doing? And there are different opinions. Some people said an angel killed those 
girls that tried to get her to kill Moshe. According to her other opinions, she herself started defending the baby and killed the girls herself. But from that point onwards, she declared herself to be the mother of this baby, and she committed to take care of him. She brought him home, and of course, the baby wouldn't eat. And she called the, the, the girl, Miriam, who was watching on the side, and said, go and find someone who's an expert at, at um, taking care of babies, at feeding babies. So the Miriam would said, oh, I know someone. And she called her own mother. And for the next two years, Basia paid Yechevet, the mother of Moshe, the mother of Moses, to take care of her own child, not even knowing that this child was the, 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 the son of the person that she was paying to take care of. And then she took Moshe, Mo, Moses, Moshe into her own palace and Moses lived in the palace as one of the princes, possibly as an heir to the throne of her, of his now step grandfather Pharaoh. Now this is going to become extremely important because Miriam is going to become an extremely large play in the story, and at the very end we'll see that so is Basia. This Basia, who who changed around her life and saved young Moses and adopted Moses to be his own, to be her own, she is going to she's going to come back around at the end of the story of Caleb and become an incredibly important story. But it's interesting how the story starts off with the two of them. Miriam and Basia, and the amazing connection they're going to have towards the end is going to come back around. But meanwhile, 40 years go by, and Miriam is still single. No one wants to marry her. Now, she came from the greatest line possible. Her father was Amram, the leader of the Jewish people. Her mother was an actual daughter of Levi, the son of Jacob, the son of Yaakov. So she was a grandson of, a granddaughter of Yaakov. She was about as prestige of a match as you could possibly find so why weren't people flocking to marry her she was 46 years old and still single and the reason was she was extremely ill the illness had taken such a horrible turn in in, in her case firstly her name literally shows to it azuva it, she was repelled no one wanted anything to do with her no one wanted to marry her she was so sickly that they just everyone saw this as a liability they're going to get married to someone who they literally have to take care of continuously so though she came from an extremely incredible pedigree her father was the leader of the jewish people at the time no one wanted to marry her and the sickness had affected her so badly that her complexion of her face turned this greenish color which made her so much less desirable in addition to being to being so sickly she was also very un unseeming to look at and so no one married her and for 46 years she was single and then Kolev came around, and Kolev was a very young boy at the time, and there's different calculations exactly how young it was, but definitely extremely young because he already had a great-grandson a very short time later, which meant that him and his descendants all married very young. But he came along and he decided she, uh, to marry Miriam. And everyone said, why are you marrying her? And he said, you know, it might not make sense, but I want to do what God wants. And I'm not going to make a marriage based on looks or ba- based on desirability or based on the fact that she might be sickly or not sickly. She's a good match. She's a good person. Her family's a good person. And he said the best way to, in- to determine how the children are going to be in a wife is you always look at the wife's siblings, the wife's brothers. And you see what type of family they were raised in. So if you look at the wife's brothers and they're good people, well then... She's probably going to raise her children the same way that her parents raised her brothers. And that's most likely what her children are going to be like. Kalev said, well, her two brothers are Aaron and Moshe. That's a fantastic, that's a fantastic, you know, lineup. I want to have children like them. And so he said, I'm going to get married to Miriam, even though she was, she was a massive liability and so unbelievably sick. He had to nurse her. And for the first part of her, of their marriage, he literally nursed her back to life. And then it, everything changed around. Her name even changed to a more pleasant name. She, in fact, became so beautiful and completely recovered and became so beautiful that when husbands wanted to talk about their wives, they said, why, why can't you be more like Miriam? Miriam became like this standard of beauty because not only did she recover and all the greenness left her, she had a rose-like complexion, she became the model of how beautiful people wanted their wives to be. And Kalev was now the jackpot winner i mean he married an incredible wife and the the two issues of the you know the sickliness and her, and her, her lack of beauty had completely turned around with the, all the care and the love that he had given her bring nursing her back to health and they were they were happily married i mean it was one of the worst times in history for the jewish people but as much as happy as they could be they they were they they had an incredible you know two incredible people and they had they had a child a child's name was Hur. and when 
Khur was very young. He had a child as well, whose name was Uri. And they in turn, and Uri in turn had a child by the name of Betzalel, who we're going to circle back around to later. Betzalel was an incredible personality and has an incredible story of his own in the desert. But when Betzalel was 12 years old and Kalev was 40 years old, so if you do the math, you realize they all got married extremely young and had children extremely young. The Jewish people were freed from imprisonment from Egypt and Moshe, Kalev's brother-in-law, Miriam's brother and Hur's uncle led them out of Egypt. They traveled in the desert, they went across the across the split sea. They came to across the other side of the split sea and Miriam let, famously led the Jewish women in praise of God. She was a prophetess, she spoke to God, and then they came to Hasin and Moshe gave the Torah to the Jewish people and they were all there. Kalev was there, his wife was there, and their his brother-in-law and um, Miriam's brother was at the top of the mountain, and but before that, an interesting thing happened. There was a there was a battle. The Amalek heard the incredible miracles that happened to the Jewish people, and Amalek said, "Well, we're not going to just sit by and watch the Jewish people get to their credit. They had a bone to pick. Firstly, Yaakov had spurned their ancestor ancestor all the way up, and they were still offended about this." you know, centuries later, and they said, well, we can't have this. They had this unnatural hatred towards the Jewish people, and they decided the whole world's in awe of the Jewish people. Even if we lose the war, to have a war will diminish their power. Everyone will say, well, you know, obviously not that scary, because look, Amalek's willing to fight with the Jewish people, and Amalek was a force to be reckoned with. To such a degree, the rabbis say that the war of Gog and Magog, which is like the messianic battle that's going to happen right before Moshiach comes, according to some opinions, already happened, World War II, maybe, it wasn't as scary as the ramifications of the War of Amalek, which means the War of Amalek, though it was finished rather quickly, and one day the whole battle was over, it was in the great merit of Moshe that it, that ended that way. It could have been a very, very disastrous battle, and it was it, the, the the ramifications of it were far more terrifying. But Moshe won the war, and how he did this was, was obviously with the help of God. Moshe appointed Yeshua to be the head of the army, and he took his brother Aaron and his nephew, the son of Kalev. And the the son of Hor, the, the the son of Kalev and Miriam, who who was Hor, and he asked Aaron and Hor to to accompany him up a hill, and he stood where he couldn't stand, but he he had them stand, and he sat because Moshe was very tall, so he needed them he needed them to to be able to hold his hands up. They both had held up either side of his hands, like his left hand and his right arm and left arm respectively, and he sat on a stone. He didn't want to sit on the couch to be comfortable while the Jewish people were battling a war and clearly uncomfortable. So he said, "I'll stay on a, I'll sit on the stone. You both hold up my arms and I'll pray to God." And so long as Moshe's arms were up in the air, the Jewish people were successful, and that's what happened. Yeshua led the battle and it was a successful. battle. Battle, and he didn't entirely destroy Amalek. They're going to come back many times throughout history, and they unfortunately still exist and still coming back in history. Uh, but the, they were greatly weakened in this war, and the war was won by the Jewish people. Hur was one of the people chosen to hold up Moshe's arms while he prayed the whole day because Hur was that type of person. His father was Kalev, his mother was Miriam, and he was an ex- exceptional person. And another another illustration before we get straight to the story of of Kalev himself, but just about Kalev's family to understand what type of family he he raised. When Moshe went up the mountain after giving the Torah, Moshe told the Jewish people who had said, well, "Who are going to ask all the questions to?" Moshe told the Jewish people, "If you have any questions, ask Aaron or ask Chor." These two people are qualified. Aaron, the older brother of Moshe, the head Koyen. Of the, the the origin, the first Kayan of all of all time, and Chur, the nephew of Moshe, the son of Kalev. If a Jewish people had any questions, those are the two people that Moshe told the Jewish people that they'll have the answers for you. Unfortunately, they did have a question, and the question came about forty days later. Moshe told the Jewish people, "I'm going up the mountain for forty days and forty nights." Now they calculated forty days and forty nights quite literally, but Moshe said forty days and forty nights, which meant only days that have days and nights, and he left during the day, which meant the day that he left wasn't counted. And it was an obvious calculation, but you could also see why people misunderstood, especially people with an agenda to try and connect to idol worship. So forty days and forty nights go by by their own calculation, and quickly they go to the seventy elders and they tell the seventy elders, Moshe hasn't come down. Additionally, it was a very dark and dismal day, and additionally, the Satan had put a coffin in the air as a test. 
Satan had put a, a coffin in the air, floating around, and everyone said, well, look, that's the coffin of Moshe. He obviously died. And they said, 40 days and 40 nights, no one could eat, you know, go that long without eating or drinking. He went to heaven. He's not coming back down. So they went to the 70 elders and said, 70 elders told him, absolutely not. You're absolutely wrong. And so the mob proceeded to slaughter them. They killed them. All 70 elders were killed by a, a fr- frantic mob who was insistent on making an idol worship. Now that Moshe hasn't come back down the mountain, they needed a new way to connect to God. And they said, well, idols are the best way to go. That's what we know about. So they just murdered 70 of the elders. But they wanted to get some, like, you know, um, official... Um, Payoff, uh, not payoff, by official um, sign off from an elder, from someone important. So the next person they went to is the person that Moshe recommended. They asked all the questions. So they went to Chor and they asked Chor, Do you give us permission, you know, now that Moshe hasn't come down and he's clearly dead, do you give us permission to make an idol? We need to make an idol. And Chor told them, Moshe is definitely alive. Moshe has done miracles far beyond not eating for 40 days and 40 nights. Compared to everything that Moshe has done until now, that's hardly anything. Look at the quail, look at the man, look at the crossing of the Red Sea. He pointed to all the amazing miracles that Moshe did. And Chor said, compared to all of those, not eating and drinking for 40 days is nothing. Of course Moshe is still alive. And he said, but even if you're right, and Moshe has indeed passed away, it's still not the right thing to bow down to an idol and to, to go against everything that Moshe stands for. Now, of course, the mob wasn't interested in hearing it. The rabbis actually say among the people that were leading the mob was Bilam's two sons. They were in Egypt at the time. When they saw the Jewish people leaving, they're like, well, this is where the action is happening. So they headed out with the Jewish people. But they were witchcrafts. And they, were, they were magicians and they were dreadful people. And they were instigated this mob to start you know, bowing down to the idol. But they hadn't yet done it. And when they heard the answer they didn't want to hear from Hur, they killed him. The mob just went at him and they, they killed him. It was a dreadful thing. He was a prophet of Hashem. So it was a very, very serious accusation. More than, of course, killing anybody, which is absolutely unforgivable and unacceptable. They had killed a prophet of God. It was something that weighed very heavily against the Jewish people. So when they went to the next person who they wanted to, they needed to get some important person to sign off on their actions of building the idol that came to Aaron. Now Aaron realized Hur, his nephew, the son of Caleb, had just been killed by this mob. And Aaron realized that there's a, a special, there's a verse that talks about the exile of the Jewish people. And it, and it associates the exile and connects it to the, the killing, the murder of a prophet and the murder of a priest, of a Koyen. And Aaron said, if they, they just murdered a prophet, if they murder me on the, straight away, the same, the same day, the same connection together, this is going to create so much damage to the Jewish people for all time. I can't have this on my watch. So he said, I'm not going to use the same strategy as Hur and just outright tell them the way it is, that what you're doing is forbidden. Aaron said, I need to slow this down. There's a mob and it's chaos. I need to, I need to tell them, come back. So Aaron says, you know what? You're giving me something to think about. You know what? How about go to your wives and ask your wives for all their jewelry. Bring back all the gold jewelry. Then we'll be ready to go. Then, I'll make, then we'll, we'll talk about making an idol. And Aaron assumed, okay, by the time, you know, days go by and they start negotiating the jewelry from their wives, you know, the, the Moshe will already be back down the mountain and this whole drama will be over. The problem is they went to their wives and the wives said, absolutely not. We're not participating in this horrible, evil action of making an idol. The women of that generation were extremely righteous. It was the men that were doing the sinning. And so they said no. So the men started taking their own jewelry. They took their own nose rings and they took their own jewelry. They brought it to Aaron. And Aaron very slowly, of course, started preparing it. You know, and told them, come back, I'll, I'll, I'll have it ready. And people were impatient, but there were magicians in the crowd. And the magicians started using magic or possibly even names of God. There's a story connected with that, throwing a name of God inside, a lay show that said, um, ox rise up. It's a story of its own. But the point was, the golden calf came from that cauldron of gold. And people started bowing down to it. And the story was dreadful. Moshe came down the mountain and he realized if he were to give these tablets over to the Jewish people, he'd essentially be signing their death warrant. And so instead of giving it over, Moshe broke the tablets before the Jewish people could receive it thereby giving them the ability to get forgiveness from God. And the rest is history. But for Khorin, for Kalev and Miriam, it wasn't. Kalev and Miriam had lost their son. The son was killed in this, in this, killed by this angry mob of idol worshippers. And that, that was it. The Jewish people now had to, had to have atonement, not just for the killing of, of Khor, but also for the idol worship that had, that had ensued. 
And Hashem told him, if you want to have atonement, the way to find atonement would be in the building of the Mishkan. And in the building of the Mishkan, Moshe is told all these incredible instructions by God. The tabernacle was, a, was, a, was basically a temple inside the desert, and the descriptions are in the Torah itself. Hashem describes to Moshe in great and vivid detail all the different instructions, all the different things that need to happen for the building of the temple, and Moshe was extremely excited about it. Firstly, this was an incredible, incredible thing being built, a house for God inside this world. It was fantastic, it was wonderful for Moshe, but also this was an opportunity for him to do something for God. And Moshe Rabbeinu was absolutely thrilled. So the whole process was such a wonderful experience for Moshe because he was in, he was hearing all the wonderful things he was able to do in the building of in the building for, of an edifice for God. And then God told him, "By the way, you're not the one to build it." And Moshe was crushed. He had assumed that he was going to be the builder of the Mishkan. God had given him all the instructions. He assumed, of course, he's the one to build it. And the rabbis explained one of the reasons why Moshe wasn't able to be the one to build it is because Moshe was now the official status of a king. He was the king of the Jewish people. A king has to be very careful about the way he behaves in public. Even a rabbi of a community has to be very careful not to be sweeping the floors in public or not to be um, schlepping in public because he's a rabbi. He's a leader of a community. Once people are appointed as leaders, they can't just do um, regular activities in public because they have to keep their, their authority and they have to keep the, a dignified state in front of everyone else. So Moshe was instructed by God, you're not the one to, to build it. Moshe was crushed because he was so excited to be, to be able to to build this house for God and now suddenly he was informed that he wasn't going to be the one to do it so he asked God who's going to be who's going to be this person and God told him there's a book and it's written by Adam Arishan the first man Adam and in the book it describes special souls throughout history and all the special tasks that are given to these special souls and Hashem told Moshe look inside the inside the book and it's and inside the book he discovered that Hur, the person who was murdered by the mob, it was going to be his grandson that was going to be the one in charge of building the Mishkan, building the tabernacle. Which is really interesting. The Ur HaChaim writes, Hur, the name Hur, like Kalev and Miriam's son, they named him Hur, it comes from the word of freedom. He was a person that gave freedom to the Jewish people, even in his own death. He gave freedom to the Jewish people and a way for them to free themselves by providing a grandson, B'Tzalel, who would build the tabernacle, thereby giving forgiveness and freedom to the Jewish people from the sin. Even though he was murdered by these very people, he was still able and willing and gave them the opportunity to have forgiveness, which is such a beautiful lesson of its own. Hashem also told Moshe not to feel bad. He said, know that although B'tzal is the one in charge of building the Mishkan, he's the one going to be given all these incredible gifts, whether in wisdom or artistry and craftsmanship, to be able to build the Mishkan, know that he's only getting this because of his relation to you. The only reason he's even in the picture is because his great-grandfather is your brother-in-law and his great-grandmother, Miriam, is your sister. He's only in this picture because... He's related to you. Now that he's related to you, okay. Now he's a contender. So don't feel so bad as if this is nothing. This is all the honor he's getting is really an extension of him being your nephew. The Jewish people, of course, came to Moshe and said, well, this is not fair. Why is your relative and why is uh, uh, a member of one tribe, Yehuda, remember Moshe came from Levi, but it was his sister's husband's great-grandson. So it followed you know, the, patri- the, the father's side. Why from only the tribe of Yehuda is the leader of the builder of the Mishkan? Why can't it be from other tribes? And Moshe said, well, this is an uncomfortable, uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversation, but do you remember what happened to Salah's grandfather? And the second he invoked that, it silenced everyone. It was, a very, it was an easy equalizer because everyone was, everyone was equally uncomfortable with how Hur had been killed by a mob. And they, everyone kind of felt responsible for it. So everyone kind of, they backed off. They, they realized this is it's kind of appropriate. It, it's apropos, apropos that a grandson of the person that was murdered would be the one to build the Mishkan, to correct all the damage that had been done. Which he did. Mitzalla built the Mishkan. And the Mishkan, right before they were ready to build it, they tried lifting up the walls and they were unsuccessful. And they brought Moshe and they, they had all of them trying. And no one was able to... to even a joined effort, unable to lift the walls. And Hashem did the kindness to Moshe, and also showing the Jewish people Moshe's importance. And Moshe was able to lift the walls by himself, showing that although he wasn't actually involved in the building, 
or the detailed building and the overseeing of the building and the inspiration of the building, the whole thing was only able to happen through Moshe himself. And lifting the walls and making it actually happen only was able to happen through the greatness of Moshe, through the ability and the influence and the help of Moshe Rabbeinu. The next part of the story involves Kalev himself, but understanding what happened to Khur is going to be very important to understand just how amazing of a person Kalev is. Understanding how Khur got murdered is going to lend so much understanding to the incredible quality of what type of person Kalev was. The Jewish people were now ready for the next stage in their, in their journey to enter Israel. They had received the Torah. They were ready. They were going to come, go into Israel and that was the natural next step. And so, right before they were about to enter, they were very, they were really very close to Israel. They t- they came to Moshe. They told Moshe, "We want to send spies." And there were many different motives of why the Jewish people wanted to send, send spies. Some of the explanations, of course, say you know they, they were very doubtful whether they were able to do it, and they said, "Well, we need help. We not we can't just rely on God," which of course was a very negative understanding of why they needed spies. But some people came to Moshe and said, "We believe in God, and we know that God's going to help us. The only thing is." If we're going to come in charging with an army, the enemy are going to hide all their belongings, which means that all of this wealth is going to be hidden and we'll have no way of finding it. But if we send spies into scouts and know the way things are before the war starts, we'll have a good way of understanding exactly where the belongings, where the valuables, where the infrastructure is all in place. And this will be very useful for us down, useful for us down the line. That actually made a lot of sense to Moshe. So Moshe went to God and said, God, the Jewish people want to send spies. Should we send spies or not send spies? And Hashem was upset. Hashem said, I, why do we need to send spies? We don't need people to help us and to assist us. This is a godly activity. God said, I'm going in front of you. But God said, if you'd like to send spies, you still can. And so Moshe decided to send spies. And the question why, of course, but that's a, that's a conversation for another time. But Moshe decided to send spies and he placed the spies in front of God. And Hashem said, these spies are good people. And the Torah itself testifies that the spies are all, were all good people. And among the, the spies, one from each tribe, from the tribe of Yehuda was Kalev, the brother-in-law of, of Moshe, the husband of Miriam, this incredible person who had been beaten by the, by the slave masters in Egypt, was now ready to be one of the spies to go into the land of Israel and report back whatever he saw. And Another one of the famous people, famous spies, was a man by the name of Yehoshua or Hoshea bin Nun. And right before he left, Moshe started doing some, some um, thinking. And Moshe said, Yehoshua, as he's now known, but at that time Yehoshua, he he's my most close student. Yehoshua never left the tent. He was always in the tent. He was cleaning the tent. He was always following after Moshe. He couldn't be parted from Moshe for a second. And so Moshe thought, if something goes wrong and Yeshua does, Yeshua, you know, doesn't follow in the exact way of God, it's going to come back to me. Because such a loyal and such a dedicated student, there's no way that I can't reflect poorly on the teacher, myself. So Moshe prayed to Hashem and added a Yud to Yeshua's name. The Yud now made his name Yehoshua instead of Hoshea as it originally was. And now Yehoshua had this extra protection, this, this ability to deal with opposition in this world without being imp- imp- affected or, or without any form of peer pressure, without any form of inclination to follow after the tests in, the, in this world. It, just, it, gave, it gave him this stoic ability to be unaffected. Interestingly enough, the reason why the Yud was added is many years earlier with with the first two Jewish people, Avram and Sarah, their original names was Avram and Sarai, and Hashem told Sarai that she he that Hashem wants to change the name and change the name Sarai with a Yud at the end to Sarah, which you know changed the meaning of her name and also now made her a person that was able to have children. The only problem was is that Yud felt. It felt gypped. It felt like it was, it was um, you know, taken out of such a godly person's uh, name. It felt, it felt upset. So it, the Yud came in front of the heavenly throne and said, I'm a small little letter and I'm being thrown around. This is not fair. So Hashem told the Yud, Hashem said, don't worry. You're right. You're taken out of Sarah's name. Her name is now Sarah with a hay at the end. And you used to be at the end of her name. What I'll do in exchange is I'll put you... At the front, you have the best real estate in a different person in another great man's name, Yehoshua. So the Yud was many years placed at the front, and that was like a that was like a compensation for the fact that it had been taken out of Sarah's name. 
the 12 spies made their way towards Israel. And they had a route. The route was to start, on from, start from the eastern, the south, southeastern corner of Israel, along the, travel along the southern border, along where the, the Amalek nation was, then to get to the, to the southwest corner of Israel, travel up the entire we, the western um, border, and thereby get a good picture of what the land was. There are other opinions that are split up in different ways and say the tribes each went to scout out their own location. But this is the, the general, one of the opinions of how it was split up was that they, they, all, went, they all went together. And what's interesting is, as they were going, Kholev starts listening to the conversations. Yeshua was entirely unaffected by the conversations. He was above it all. But Kholev, on the other hand, was listening to the conversations and he started to realize that they were having a discussion of their own. They had a whole bunch of motives that didn't seem to run at all in line with what their mission was. Their mission was to go and see the land and bring a report back of what they see, what they saw. But now Kholev starts hearing them have a discussion about the actual plan itself. Is it a good thing in general for the Jewish people to, move to, to go to Israel? Is it not a good thing to go to Israel? And the more the conversation was going, the more the Kholev had to see people that had started off with such, such righteous men were now starting to get plagued with, with horrible ideas. And the, the tr- most troubling part about it was that the, the ideas made sense. Kholev started to feel a resistance within himself. He started, he started saying, well, I know what my mission is. And I know we're supposed to come back and say good things about Israel. And not, of course, challenge Moshe and his mission given to him by God to go into the land and conquer the land. But the, the arguments that the spies were making were, right, were very, very compelling. And the more that Kholev listened to the, to the advice and the ideas of the other ten spies... Of course, of course, excluding Yoshua, the more that Kalev felt himself getting drawn in. And at some point, Kalev realized he needed some extra help. He needed some godly assistance to repel these ideas and, and fortify himself. And so he told the spies he's taking a detour. And instead of going along with them, he went on his own to Hevron. Interestingly enough, as we're going to mention in part number two, this was going to be land that it was going to belong to him later on. But he went to the city of Hebron, and in the city of Hebron was that plot of land that Avram had purchased from Ephraim, where he had he himself he had buried his wife, and then he had, then he was buried, and Yitzchak and Rivka were buried there, and Yaakov and Leah were buried there, and he went to that burial site, which is such a holy place, one of the holiest places of the Jewish people, and he he prostrated himself there and begged. God to have pity on him and enable him to be strong. And he begged the forefathers, he said, pray on my behalf, enabling me to be strong. And what's interesting is that only two spies that made it out successfully was Yeshua and Kalev. Yeshua had help from Moshe. Kalev, it was this incident, him going to his for, the, the Mar Samach Pela in Hebron, the burial site of the our forefathers in Hebron, and begging God to help him out is what that attributed to his incredible success and his ability to, to repel such strong pressure from such influential and powerful people, the other ten spies. Now the question, of course, is what was the motive? Why did they, why did they suddenly become sour? These were very special people. These people were lined up by Moshe in front of God, and God said, yeah, they're really good people. They're called men, and the description of men in the Torah is not about male, it's called that they're upstanding people. These are righteous men. So what happened? How did they suddenly become so dreadfully bad? And the end of the story, as we'll get to in a bit, it really ended terribly. So what happened in between, in between then? What, was, what made these people change? What made them flip from being really good people to doing such a dreadful thing? And some of the motives, I'll read them out, some of the motives sound rather understandable. One of the motives brought down is that when they were in the desert... They were living a spiritual life. They were praying to God, entirely understood anything. They didn't have to think about food or drink. The food came from heaven, man, and the water was a well that followed them around. Their clothes grew with them as they grew and never got dirty. They didn't have to worry about a single thing in physicality. They could just learn and pray and just connect to God. And they thought to themselves, we're going to go into Israel and we're going to turn into farmers. How much time are we going to have to pray? How much time are we going to have to learn? How much time are we going to have to commune with God and connect to God? Nothing. A little here, a little there, a little in the morning, a little in the afternoon, a little at night. And that's it. The rest of the day we're going to be chasing around oxes and bulls and dealing with this world. We don't want to do that. We want to connect to God. So I said, well, simple. Well, let's just 
tell the Jewish people not to go into Israel. We'll stay in the desert and we'll keep this thing going and we'll, we'll serve God, you know, in a spiritual heightened way without having to deal with the world. And that made a lot of sense, actually. That was a rather strong objective. And Kholev was listening to this discussion and he's like, well, that actually makes quite a bit of sense. Another one of the arguments that they had was, they said, we have a tradition that Moshe is not going to enter Israel. Moses was the leader they loved, and the way they behaved later doesn't really sound like it, but they did. They loved Moses, they loved Moshe so deeply, and they thought, well, if we're going to go into Israel, he's going to die now. If we, however, stop the Jews from going into Israel, well, that, that pretty much postpones Moshe's life. So long as we haven't entered Israel, Moshe's still alive, leading the, his generation. So I said, well, simple, we'll just convince the Jews not to go into Israel, they'll stay in the desert, and then we'll be able to have Moshe for as long as possible. Ironically, that's exactly what happened. They got exactly what they wished for. But the, and again, the logic is rather sound. It kind of makes it kind of makes sense. Another one is when they arrived there, people were dying. Everywhere they went, they they saw people be, being buried, people pe- 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 people dying. And what, what what it really was is God had made a plague, and the plague had killed a lot of people, keeping them extremely busy. So twelve Jewish people are walking around the land of Israel, and otherwise would have been killed in a second. But people were so busy dealing with the pandemic that was going on in the land of Israel, they completely ignored the, sla- the, the, the spies. Interestingly, there's the other opinions. One opinion says that Moshe gave his stick to them and said, if anyone ever troubles you, this stick will put, the, the stick of Moshe, a godly stick, is going to help you out. And that's actually what kept them safe. Another opinion says that what kept them safe was a 12-letter name of God, Zeh, the word Zeh which is what Moshe said, talks about when sending the spies, has the numerical value of 12. And Moshe said, there's a 12-letter name of God that can keep you safe. And just say that name if you ever find yourself in trouble. But they saw the, Jew- they saw the land of Canaan extremely, in an extremely chaotic form. And instead of realizing it was a blessing from God to keep them safe, they said, well, look, look at this. The air of the land is killing its own inhabitants who were so strong. Imagine what will happen to us if we go there. We don't stand a chance. So instead of taking the blessing, they took it as a, as a sign of, of doom. And they, it, it's, when you present it in such a way, it sounds, it sounds rather compelling. Another opinion is that the... They said they saw the people, and this is the, this is the more this is the most common opinion. They saw the people, they saw the empires, they saw the magic, they saw the the giants, and they said, "Well, this is just impossible. It, this is too formidable of an enemy for us to conquer." And according to some opinions, they they weren't even talking about the Jewish people. They said, "This is even too strong for God to conquer. God's strong, and He could do amazing things, but conquering an, a land like this with such powerful people that's even beyond God." That's what the, the spies were claiming. And one interesting, one last opinion, because. This is really interesting just to wonder how such amazing people became so badly corrupted and what logic could do if you, if you just let logic go wild without any you know, belief in God. They said, and the Ben Yoyada brings this down, he says that the Jews want, that the spies said we need to create some form of test for the Jewish people because otherwise they're just going to go into Israel and they wouldn't have earned it at all. They just go with a red carpet straight into Israel. But if we create some form of dilemma, some form of test where we badmouth Israel and then they they fortify themselves and they they do the right thing, well then they would have earned Israel. Now, again, sounds like sounds like an argument at least. Whether how strong of an argument, it does still sound like an argument. And Kolev was finding himself struggling with all these really strong arguments. And then Kolev went to to. Marisa, he went to Hebron, he went to Marisa Machpelah, to the, to, the, to the cave where Avram and all the ancestors are buried, and he prayed to God saying, give me the strength to be able to fortify myself, unlike Yeshua who didn't have to contend with all of this, he didn't have those difficulties, Kolev had to deal with it, he had to actually struggle against all of these issues, and he had to somehow make himself strong, and this incredible ability of Kolev to be loyal to Moshe, and loyal to God, and say, you know what, these are really compelling arguments, but nonetheless, God told us, this is what we need to do, and whether it makes sense, whether there's so many good logics of, of what the spies' motives and agendas are, I'm going to do what Moses told us, what Moshe told us, that God wants us to do, and just not get sidetracked. That was the incredible personality that, Ka- that, that Kalev was. And he managed to do it. He stayed loyal, but he was clever about it. He didn't tell them that he was, that he, that he was against them. He pretended the whole time like he was on their side. So as they're plotting all their plots, he, he remains pl- silent. And he doesn't seem to indicate in the slightest that he doesn't disagree. And they were thrilled because here is Moshe's own brother-in-law, the husband of Miriam, and he seems to be on their side. They had one very contentious moment. When they came to 
Hevroin later on as a group. And it's a whole discussion how exactly it worked and what the root was. But at some point they came to that area and they started cutting down fruit. And there's a whole discussion whether the spies wanted to or not, didn't want to cut the fruit and bring the fruit. But according to one opinion, the spies didn't want to bring the fruit. And the reason was, they said, people are going to see the fruit and they're going to say, well, this is amazing. And they're going to want to go to Israel. And Kalev realized that would be a problem. He wanted the fruit to come, according to one opinion. And so he told the spies, we need to bring the fruit back. And they said, "Why? This is this is this is not this is not fitting in with our new agenda." And Kalev pulled out a sword on them. He said, "Either you bring the fruit, or we're going to war." And they they saw things escalate, and so they said, "Okay, we'll bring the fruit." And so they split the fruit up. Yeshua and Kalev interestingly didn't bring the fruit, but Kalev wanted to make sure that the fruit came there in the hopes that Jewish people would see such a wonderful fruit, and they would be inspired to come up to Israel. Unfortunately, the sl- the the spies. St- turn the agenda and say, well, look how powerful the fruit are. Imagine what the people are like. But Kalev was hoping that the people, the Jewish people would see through that and realize what a wonderful land the land of Israel was. While they were cutting the fruit, in that area lived three giants. They were the, they were the sons of an, another giant whose name was Anak. And the three giants' names were Achiman, Sheshai, and Talmai. Three massive giants. These, these giants weren't tall men. It's a big mistake people try to think. It wasn't like they were 10 feet tall, extremely, extremely, or 20 feet tall. They were giants, which meant they, they, were, they were larger than cities. They, they, they were so, so large that when they walked through the ground, they created massive furrows in the ground. We're talking about people that, that weren't of large size. They were actual a whole breed of giants. The origin story is very interesting, but not for this class. But the point was, these people lived in Israel at the time. And they saw people, they saw 12 Jewish people cutting down, you know, a, 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 bu- a bunch of grapes and a pomegranate and a fig. And one of them, Talmai, lets out a roar. And the roar itself, not even touching them, just the roar, the scream, was so so powerful, it knocked them all out. They were all unconscious, which, of course, put them in an extremely dangerous situation. But interestingly enough, according to one opinion, these three giants weren't bad. They're usually presented as being bad, but according to one version, they weren't bad at all. And they actually blew like air at the at the the 12 spies waking them up and they told the 12 spies the land of Israel belongs to the Jew, belongs to God and God gives it to whoever he chooses don't be worried about all the opposition that you look like you're going to face when coming into Israel and in exchange of their comforting words God gave these three giants extremely long life and they lived until the destruction of the second temple we're talking about 1100 years later and change in exchange for their comforting words and not harming the 12 spies when they originally came to Israel. That's one of the versions of, of the incident with the 12 spies. But regardless, they took the fruits. And they make their way back to Israel. 40 days they spend, back to the desert. They spend 40 days in the desert. They make their way back to Israel. And now comes one of Kalev's most famous and one of Kalev's most difficult moments because now they're all coming to Moshe and Aaron. They come to the leadership and they're telling the leadership, listen, here's a report of what we're... The spies, they have to bring a report. Instead of bringing a report, they brought an opinion, which was the, the big mistake of the spies. But the report was expected. They, they were going to tell Moshe what they saw there. That was, that was their job. And Yeshua was the first one to start. And Yeshua wants to preempt and get straight in there and say what a wonderful land the land of Israel was. And before he can even start, the spies begin to bully him. They tell him, How, why is a headless man talking? What do they mean by that? They meant Yeshua was a, a person who didn't have any children or only had goals, according to some opinions. And they said, well, you're, it's so clear that you don't have you know, uh, the ability to, to, to have the merit to even talk. Why are you even talking? And they said words like this that just stopped Yeshua from talking. And so Yeshua was silent. And so they turned to Kalev, the next natural person to speak. And the thing was, they assumed until now that Kalev was on their team. So there was a whole mob of people. And there was the ten spies. And everyone's waiting to see what Kalev was going to say. And they were making a lot of noise. And there were people that were nervous about what Kalev was going to say. And the crowd was all rowdy, exactly the same type of um, situation as when Hur was murdered, and everyone's looking to see what Kalev is going to say, and Kalev got the qu- crowd quiet that's what the Apostle said, he asked Kalev he also, Kalev got them all quiet, and what's interesting is the rabbis say, Kalev was very smart he got up, and he said, is this everything that the son of Amram has done to you? and they were, they were thrilled that he started off his speech in such a way that he called Moshe, instead of calling Moshe by his actual name, he called the son of Amram, as if he's saying something derogatory towards him. He's like, he's not even worthy enough to mention his own name. He has to mention his father's name. 
and he's phrased the 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 sentence in such a way that like there's nothing else. That's all that, that all that we've mentioned about the greatness of Moshe has already been mentioned, which makes it sound like he's about to start a really really negative converse, conversation about Moshe. So everyone became extremely quiet, and then. Following that sentence through, he says Moshe crossed the sea. And Moshe gave us all these amazing miracles. Do you think it's a problem for us to go into Israel? So he turned the tables. He got them all quiet. He started off with something that seemed negative. He got them all quiet. And then he began to t- extol the great praise of Moshe and the great pr- praise of the land. And he said, even if Moshe would give us ladders and tell us to climb to heaven, we would be able to do it. And we, we, we should do it. And he says, we'll go. And as the rabbis explain, the ability of us going will automatically create the possibility for us to be successful. We just have to start off. Sometimes you face things that are too difficult, challenges that are too hard, and you say, well, it's impossible. And Kolov is, Kolov is telling the Jewish people, yes, this might seem impossible. It might seem like there's a million reasons not to do it, but this is our instructions from God. Let's start. And us starting will pave the way for our success. Now, of course, they weren't thrilled. They'd been backstabbed. They, they, um, Kalev had double-crossed them. He, they'd assumed that he was on their team. And suddenly, he started off the speech, getting in words that they had no intent. They, didn't want, they wanted to silence him. They didn't, want to, they didn't want him telling them, telling the Jewish people the truth. And now, suddenly, he's telling them the truth. And so they said, okay, they'll start a riot. And that's exactly what they started, pelting Yeshua and Kalev with stones. And if not for Hashem's cloud of glory that literally protected them, Kalev would have died exactly the same way that his son was murdered by the crowd. He would have been killed. And it's so interesting that Kalev wasn't scared about this. Kalev knew what had happened the previous time, and he was expecting the results that actually, he was expecting to be killed. And he was prepared to be killed, and he knew the stones were coming, and they did come, and it was God intervened and saved his life. But had that not happened, he would have gone the same way that his son, that his son went. And of course, the end of that story is extremely unfortunate. The spies were all killed in an extremely gruesome way. Their tongues fell to their... To their, their stomach area and worms crawled in and they died in an unbelievably gruesome way all the people that cried and mourned on that day which happened to unfortunately fall out on Tisha B'Av, the first time when that day was already a day, a day prepared for punishment or prepared for sadness that all the people that cried that entire generation all the people of the military age 20 and higher every single one of them died over the next 40 years in the desert one day for one year so the 40 days the spies spent in the land of Israel scouting, a year was put for the Jewish people to remain in the desert. And then finally, when every single one of the generation died, including Miriam and Moshe and Aaron, when all of them were, had all passed away, aside for the two loyal spies, Kalev and Yeshua, once everyone else had passed away, they finally were given the permission by Hashem to enter the land of Israel, which made Kalev really an interesting, an interesting person. He had, he had been in Egypt, and together with his friend and then his his leader Yeshua, he had gone through the entire experience of the desert, and then as one of the only elderly men among an entire um, nation of millions of Jewish people, he. As a, as a male elderly person, was one of two people to enter the land of Israel. And we'll talk about what the entering of the land of Israel is on in part number two of this class, but Kolo's story is far from over. But what's interesting is we get to see a little bit of his own, about his personality, the strength of his character, his ability to not be above opposition and above um, um, issues in this world like Yeshua was, not even contending with them. Kolev knew how to contend with it. And Kolev had the requirement to contend with it, and yet his ability was to contend with this world, contend with opposition, contend with peer pressure, contend with troubles and tribulations, and somehow plow his way through it and still be connected to God and be loyal to Moshe in spite of it all.